Hello everybody, hello masters of your own destiny. What's going on? Welcome back to my basement. I'm extremely happy to, of course, to have you back because it's thanks to you and your company and your loyalty that we put the effort, the care and the love to produce this podcast every other week. And of course, it's also thanks to WCNY, PBS in Central New York, and Central New York Arts that we can come to you every other week. They are our partners who believe in the mission of our podcast and two amazing nonprofit organizations that help us to produce this podcast for you. I want to remind you that you can go and visit fsbaseman.com. That is our home in the internet. If you want to listen to past episodes, or watch the video for past episode. The entire library is there in fsbaseman.com beside really cool uh, educational tools that you can use. So please go and visit fsbaseman.com, follow ups in all social media. We are everywhere. So just tap from Suarez Baseman. We are in TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. I mean, you name it, we are there and we would love for you to be part of our family. Today, I'm very happy and very glad to have the creator and the lead writer for one of my favorites. And yes, it's true. I have many favorite TV shows, but I truly, truly love this show called Julia in Max. It is a show based in Julia Child uh, life. Uh, and Danielle uh, Goldfarb is in the house, or in this case, in the basement, to talk about uh, script writing, character developing, the business of script writing, but of course also about the show Julia. So thank you for tuning in. Let's start this new conversation with Daniel Goldfarb right away here in front of Suarez Space. Here we go. Daniel, I want to welcome you to my basement. Thank you so much for agreeing to this conversation. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah. Are you in New York, right? I am in New York. Yes. Fantastic. I'm in Syracuse, New York. Uh, what we call the real upstate New York. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, I, I'm excited. I'm very happy and glad to have this conversation with you. I teach script writing for television. It's one of my passions. Uh, is not only uh, to watch TV. I watch, you name it, everything. <laughs> In the stream media, I think I, I, I watch it. But I love to discover new talent to the process of script writing. And that's fascinating. I know you also work in that. I just want to start kind of from scratch in the sense, when do you discover that writing was something that you were passionate about it and that you were good about? So honestly, I've been writing for as long as I can remember. I wrote short stories as a little boy. And then um, I went to, I grew up in Toronto and I went to the high school for the performing arts and I was a drama major and there was a one act play festival of student written acted and produced directed and produced plays and I wrote a play and it got picked and um and I realized sort of right away that I I wasn't an actor and that I was a writer and it was um it was like a real love at first sight I mean it was I really felt it in my bones I became very very passionate I ended up having plays selected three years in a row in high school and uh, and then I became determined to study writing, playwriting uh, specifically. So uh, I came, um, you know, all my siblings had gone to university in Canada, which is much less expensive than university in the United States. But there wasn't such a program that existed at the time in Canada. And I found this dramatic writing program where I'm now on the faculty um, that where you learned playwriting and screenwriting and dramatic literature and cinema studies and uh and i got in and you know i moved to new york and i never left that's such a, a good story because it's a full circle right i mean you went there for school and suddenly now you are faculty in your own school where you graduate and yeah, that is yeah. Almost, yeah it must feel really surreal right it uh, i mean i've been a part of that place for a long time so i started teaching not that long after i graduated and then but first i was teaching non-majors and then you know, I was an adjunct faculty and then I started teaching, you know, freshmen and sophomore and intro classes. And slowly I worked my, my way up. And this summer, actually, I became an associate arts professor and I'm on sabbatical, my first sabbatical. So I'm <laughs> teaching in 1999 and I got my first sabbatical. So well, congratulations. That's so exciting. 
Yes, I'm looking forward for that sabbatica too. But I'm, not, I'm, yeah, I'm not there yet. Uh, <laughs> I will. I will. Listen. So you teach. You teach script writing. Um, you teach. Not only you teach, but you you write. That's that's what you do. And and of course, we're going to talk about Julia, which is one of my favorite TV shows uh, oh, r- right now. There. But I'm curious to know in your own experience. Through the process of writing, but not only of writing, but reading a lot of scripts, uh, what distinguish a good script from a bad script? What What do you think are points that you say, okay, this need to be in the script in order to consider for me as an expert in the field to consider that it's a well written script? To me, the thing that most excites me is is coming across a new voice, a fresh voice, you know, a story that I feel like. Not that, you know, of course, so all stories have basically been told. So it's not like you come up with a story that no one's ever told before, but you're telling it in a, in a new way, in a specific way that you're accessing your own content, your own experience, your own way of looking at the world. And uh, when you find a fresh voice, it's really exciting. I think the rest of it can be taught. I think you can. I mean, as a, as a teacher, I think you can encourage students and give them exercises to help them access their voices and and go to you know scarier, deeper, uh, less you know uh, stable ground, which I think is important to do as a young writer. And then you can, I think, you you can you know read and watch and study and learn the fundamentals of dramatic structure that I think you know from Aristotle to they they still stand they still work there are stories that aren't aristotelian that work but you know there's i don't know there's nothing better than a really good story so i i think we can really help students once they have their voice and once they mm. um have sort of figured out who they are and their point of view and what they're confused about what they're obsessed with what they're angry about um you know that's part of the gift of being a young writer you have something that you want to say mm. Uh, and then, you know, I feel like our job is to help you say it and learn uh, the sort of the tools of dramatic structure, you know, learning about whatever conflict and hero journey and subtext and stakes and story want and story motor. And if you can apply all of that to your voice, then mm-hmm. I think you're on the way. What do you think about students who could say, uh, not only students, any writer out there who could say, well, I'm too young. I don't have the experience to write something deep, uh, to write a characters that have these life experience. So I, I don't think that's true. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I feel like, again, the one thing that you bring to your laptop or your, to the blank page that no one else brings is you, you know, everything else, someone else can bring to the, to the computer. So now look, it's easier said than done. Like all of those, you know, amazing phrases, like write what you know, well, what do we know? You know, I mean, it's not like, oh, I know this and I'll write, you know, you're, especially when you're young, you don't know anything, you know, you know, you know what gets you worked up, but again, and you don't want to write something where you know the answers to all the questions before you start writing it. You know, you want to ask tough questions and try and find the answers through writing about it. So Mm I feel like um, we all have that. And if we can draw from it specifically and truthfully, our work will touch universal chords and uh, will affect people. Mm. And I think a lot of people don't have the confidence to think their life is interesting enough to write about. But I actually think everyone's life is interesting enough mm-hmm. to write about. Mm-hmm. And I think you you make a good point. I, I say to my students uh, also, Listen, yes, you are your own individual, but that doesn't mean that you have not experienced certain emotions already. I think it doesn't matter how old you are, you already experienced love and, and, and hate and jealousy or rejection, right? And when you're young, those experiences haven't been like dull. They're fresh, they're raw. You're, if you're feeling them for the first time, you know, as you get older, you you find tools to, to cope with those feelings. But when you're younger, you don't have those tools yet. So if you can... If you can draw from those feelings that you felt, again, it's not about writing autobiographical. It's writing about how where you felt. And mm-hmm. um, 
It's mm-hmm. about getting to sort of like the deeper truth of the truth. It's not just, it's not, you know, a, a, a television script or a play or a screenplay is not, and shouldn't be like reading your diary. I'm not telling students to just like tell their story. Um, of course, you know, but take those things that you felt, those passions, those yearnings, those things that you've really like wrestled with, those ideas and those questions that you've struggled with and explore that in your writing. And if you use some autobiography, great, but then we're also going to give you tools to sort of maybe add conflict and stakes where maybe the, the stakes weren't as high in real life. So it's that it's that line, it's that delicate balance that you have to find between um, telling a great story and drawing from your own experiences. Mm. And coming back to my uh, question about what distinguishes a good script from a, a, a bad script, my my question is more a technical question in the sense that are you, uh, you know, I, I always say to my students, you need to find a balance, for example, when you do your actions. You're not writing a novel. You cannot use a whole page to describe an action uh, unless it's important for the story. But when you open a script, in your own experience that you have plenty, you immediately could say, hmm, this is quite a heavy written script, technically. What is the things that you feel like, you know, I, I have a good example in the sense that one of the interviews I did for the podcast, which was fascinating, was interviewing uh, one of the directors of Breaking Bad. And I was talking about the same question. What, what is a good script? And he said to me, well, I normally like script where if I only read the dialogues, I don't need to read the action. The dialogues for me is just what it gives me the connection with the script. How about you? What is that that you feel, hmm, this is a very well-written script? Well, in um, in visual storytelling, which is television and screenwriting, I personally, and then I do it in my own um, te- screen and television writing, I feel like you want to hear the voice of the author in the across the page. So I don't think you want the stage direction, you know, the across the page to just feel technical. I think you want to feel the spirit of the show. You want to feel the energy of the show. So when you get to the dialogue, you already know how to read it. You already know the subtext, you know, the tone, you know, the spirit, the energy of it. So I, you know, in like in old Hollywood scripts, like the, the across the page really is very, very technical. And I now again, in your across the page, it's not fiction, it's not prose. You can't write things that the audience isn't gonna see, but you can write things that give everyone involved in the script, the actors, the, you know, the cinematographer, the editor, everybody, the director, obviously, um, a sense of what the spirit, what the tone, what the energy, what the pace is of the script. You you don't want your across the page to be fighting what the script is. Even if you have all these amazing details, um, if they're getting in the way of the flow of the script, then they don't belong in the script. Mm. You want to, you want to give the across the page that gives us the gestures, the moments, the, the subtext that sort of balances the dialogue that works with, or sometimes against the dialogue. You want all of that in the across the page. Mm. And before we move to Julia, uh, because I'm counting, you know, I, I have half an hour, so I'm like, okay, I need to be sure that I can talk about Julia. I just freaking love it. But before we go there and we, we move from this process of script writing and a good script from an, a, a bad script and a your history of how you start writing, it's the other side, right, which is the business side. Is it, it, this idea that, okay, I love to write. I have the talent. I have the tools of being able to write. Any anybody who is listening to the podcast or any of our students, but the question is always how I reach out, how I pitch, how because it seems almost impossible, right? It's this idea: well, if I don't live in Hollywood or I'm not connected to somebody, that is really tricky for me to actually pitch my show. Tell me a little bit about your own experience, right? Because you have been working, of course, with with Max, and, uh, HBO Max, or now it's called Max, uh, and and other networks. How that process happened, and what is your kind of advice to new writers that are coming out uh, to 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 reach that business aspect of of writing? So, I came up as a playwright, and my passion was very much playwriting. 
And my plays are all pretty personal. And you, I think you get a real sense of my voice in my plays. And I, you know, and I feel like those early scripts that you write, whether it's a play or whether it's a pilot or whether it's a small movie, um, you want to really convey your voice. I always say to my students, like my favorite plays are the plays where at the end of the play, I feel like I know the playwright, whether I do or not. That's what I want to feel when I go to the theater. And I think that's what people... Uh, in in Hollywood are looking for when they're look, or not all people, obviously mm -hmm. Hollywood is varied and there's all the, but in terms of the trajectory of my career and the kinds of people that gave me breaks and staffed me in writer's rooms or, or hired me to write scripts, they were looking for voices, you know, that's not to say they wanted what I wrote to be in my voice, but because I had a voice they trusted that I could write in a, in a different voice. You know what I mean? Um, this goes back to what we were saying at the beginning of the conversation. It's all about voice. So I think you have to write something that means that's meaningful to you. Mm. You have to write something that you really care about. And if you really care about it, I feel like someone else will also care about it. And someone else will also have those same passions and will read your script and will find the universal in the specific. And that's how you're going to get your break as opposed to like writing a genre script that you think the market is looking for. Mm -hmm. I think that's a harder way to get a break. I mean, but now there are definitely people that have gotten breaks that way and that do that kind of writing. I don't do that. You know, no one's hired me to write whatever an, an action movie or a Marvel right. movie. So maybe there are, maybe there are different paths, but I can say the path that worked for me was really investing in my voice and really trying to write things that I would want to watch. And that would, um, mm. and, and when I'm writing it, I'm like, I'm lost in it. I'm, I'm not outside it. I'm inside it. I feel like those scripts and when I'm now that I'm on the other side, you know, with Julia, when I, you know, now that I'm staffing a writer's room, those are the writing samples that I'm looking for, where I feel like, oh my, you know, even if that person's work is nothing like Julia, it's like, wow, this person has a voice, this person has a point of view, this person's really interesting. I want to meet them because they seem like the kind of person that I would want to sit in a room with all day, every day and talk mm -hmm. about story. So, well... Uh, let me tell you, uh, I, I know it sounds like a broken record if you hear this from me before in my podcast, but I think it is important to establish that for me, a good television, good storytelling have four fundamental uh, columns, things I'm looking for. Uh, score writing is, is is the base. You need to have good writing, which in this case, we have a fantastic writer. And today, of course, we have the privilege to be talking with, with the lead writer, creator of the show. Uh, acting, of course, is important, right? You can have a great story, but if the acting is not convincing me of the emotions, I'm out. Uh, production value and editing. That for me is my four things I look in a show. And Julia have the four, for sure. I mean, the production value is that's, it's just like, it, I cannot wait to hear a little more about backstage, how you guys filmed the whole thing. How Julia came to you, meaning this was something that Max came to you and said, we want to develop this story or you propose a story? So uh, neither of those things. So okay. I was um, I was writing, I was on the writing staff of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. That's correct. And there is a, there was a manager at Three Arts named Kimberly Carver. And she is friends with the man who runs the Julia Child Foundation. And she came up with the idea of doing a show about Julia. But she she didn't know what the show would be. She just was like, a show about Julia. Everyone loves Julia. So she was looking for takes. And I, um, I love food. The first pilot I ever wrote, um, I wrote a pilot for CBS about a restaurant critic who reviews restaurants in disguise. I've always wanted to do a food project. So my manager knew that. And I was working on Mrs. Maisel, which was a period show and aspirational and optimistic. And so I was submitted. I had written a pilot for Showtime all about a marriage and um, called Genesis. And Kim really responded to the pilot and she met with me. And then I sort of pitched basically what the show is. Like in a shorthand, I was like, it's the crown meets Mrs. Maisel. And it's Julia's second act. And it's about the invention of a modern marriage. And it's about, it doesn't overlap with the Meryl Streep movie. It's her time in the 60s. It's inventing food television. And um, and I got the job. So that was how that went. Then we, um, then I brought my friend Chris Kaiser on board to sort of be my partner. 
And then we had to pitch it to Lionsgate. Um, Lionsgate is a studio and Lionsgate owns something like 49% of Three Arts. So anything that Three Arts develops, mm. they take to Lionsgate first. So Lionsgate heard the pitch. I mean, I developed a pitch. Lionsgate heard the pitch. They bought it. And then they felt like the best way to try and sell Julia would be with a script because Julia's like, whatever, it's not Game of Thrones. It's not The Last of Us. There aren't big set action pieces. It's really about the charm of Julia and the company she keeps. So they um, they paid me to write a pilot and I wrote a pilot and then we pitched it and um, and HBO Max bought it. So that that's the story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. So you have now the responsibility to write a show that has already been approved about a person that really exists, right? That is when things can become tricky because you are not creating fictional characters. You're creating, um, even when a lot of the the storylines and characters in Julia are not, you know, are not real, are based in Lucy based in Julia Child's life, you still need to, you know, do some research and, and process. How was that process to say, okay, now I need to know this person very well in order for me to write about? So uh, the good news about Julia is there's just a lot of information about her. So there's a number of books, including books she wrote herself, including books her nephew wrote. Um, There's a bunch of biographies. There's her sort of autobiography, My Time in France. There's also, of course, all of her uh, interviews in magazines, all her talk show appearances. And then last but not least, there's The French Chef. There's all like Mm -hmm. 200. So it's the French chef. So I could really immerse myself in Julia. And what our sort of our mandate was even that we wanted to get to the kernel of what we felt was the truth of Julia um, and the heart of Julia. And we wanted to use all the research, but we were doing what we call the Amadeus version of Julia's life. I don't know if you know the movie Amadeus. It's not necessarily Mm -hmm. what did happen, but it's what could have happened. Mm -hmm. And Every I stand by everything that we do on the show could have happened and maybe did happen, but it just hasn't been uh, documented in that way just because of the way history gets written. But nothing, um, we're, we're not pulling anything out of a hat. All the stories we're telling are rooted in the research. So, for example, we don't know if Julia did the show behind Paul's back. Mm-hmm. But what we do know is that the Childs did not own a television that Paul lost his job, that they moved back to Boston and he was forced to retire, that sales of the book were dwindling. And we do know that she went on this show I've been reading and at the last minute brought a copper bowl and eggs and a whisk and made an omelet and accidentally invented food television. We do know that. But, and we do know that Julia wrote a letter to WGBH proposing a television show. That all exists and that's all fact. What we don't know is that she did it behind Paul's back and then Paul said, I don't think it's a good idea. And then she had to convince Paul to get on board. And then she carried this secret and over the course of the season, their marriage evolved into a modern marriage. But even though, but I think that could have been what actually happened, knowing where Paul was emotionally. And knowing where society was that, you know, the idea of a man being retired and his wife going back to work in in that time period, and especially because he lost his job in a way that was humiliating to him and that they were such snobs that they like, I mean, in 1962, everyone had TVs. They literally didn't own a TV until she got her own TV show. So knowing that made me feel like I know I'm making this up and it's not in any of the books, but I stand by it. It's all supported in the research. And that's how we that's how we did every episode. So mm-hmm. everything we do in every episode is all supported in the research, even though we're we're dramatizing some mm-hmm. things. And again, I mean, listen, you you one of the objective of what you're doing is, is entertain, right? This is no a documentary about Julia Child. This is a, a TV Correct. show, right? So you have to play with with the no fiction. But something that's been really gratifying is, okay, so the Julia Child Foundation, you know, they're consultants on the show and they've been incredibly supportive. And then especially when season one came out, we heard from so many people that knew Julia 
and felt like the show and Sarah Lancashire, who brilliantly plays Julia, that we really captured her and that we, because we got to slow the story down, we got to really get into her interior life and the mm -hmm. sort of quiet side and the private side of Julia that hasn't been portrayed before. And, um, and, and, and the people that knew her felt like we, you know, we did her proud. So that was incredibly rewarding that the, that the people that knew Julia, um, you know, embraced some of the creative fictional choices we made and felt that we were actually getting at a, at a, at a deeper truth, at a real truth. That's always very good, right? Is it would be worse if it's totally the opposite, right? It's like, when yeah, of course, right. of course, that would have been awful. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, were you involved in the casting, Daniel? It was a process that you were a, a director. Yes, I was absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the role of um, Paul was written with David Hyde Pierce in mind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Julia was uh, was complicated because we because it was announced we had someone else playing Julia, and then we lost her. And then, you know, it, there's not a lot of people that can play Julia. And um, and when we lost her, I thought, uh oh, the whole thing might go away and fall apart. And it was our casting director that put Sarah Lancashire's name on the list. And I, I, I knew Happy Valley, which I thought was totally mm -hmm. brilliant. I didn't quite know the depth and the body of her work. And everyone at the network was like, Sarah Lancashire, she's amazing. She's amazing. So I started watching Last Tango in Halifax. And then I started reading that she had, you know, played Miss Adelaide and Guys and Dolls in the West End and that she does musical comedy and she sings. And I was like, oh my God, she can do everything. Because my fear just from Happy Valley, is like, she's, you know, it's so heavy. <laughs> and she's amazing. <laughs> you know, but like Julia is delightful. And um, and then we met her and she was, you know, and she's delightful. And um, so I, it's funny. We ended up getting very, very lucky. And um, oh, I, I'll tell you, the actors in the world. So I, I'm just blowing away because I was, I was just talking to my husband, which is also a huge fan of the show. Uh, we were just fascinated because I say, well, imagine as an actor, you need to now impersonate this this person who has a very distinguished voice, um, mm -hmm. this very distinguished mannerisms of how she moves. But at the same time, you need to, as an actor, you have to mm, absorb that information, but you also need to give me emotions and, and moments of, of, of vulnerability. And it has to be very, I, I'm just fascinated because it's when you're playing a, a, playing a character that is a fictional character for the first time, even when the director and the writer have a sense of who this character is, you don't need to try to, to force this another world, but to adapt yourself to this voice that already exists. And she does it brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, it's, she's incredible. I, I and I feel like, ah, and everyone around her, you know, and also she's, she's just a, a really hard worker. Like she takes it very seriously. Like any in between takes, she's like looking at footage of the real Julia. She's letter perfect on her lines. She's just a pro like, yes, she's very, um, present and spontaneous, but she's also very prepared. And because she worked so hard and because David worked so hard, everybody else worked just as hard. And I think that's why I feel like we have like the best ensemble out there. Like they're all, um, everyone sort of stepped up and everyone did their characters proud. And um, yeah, I love all of them. I, I love it. And you can see it's a great chemistry before between all of them. Uh, it's a scene that just jumped my mind, but I think it's the moment that they bring the new refrigerator to set, and you know, is the is the advertising placement in in the set, uh, and they're yeah, asking yeah. her to to open the fridge a little slower, and I just cry. <laughs> her face is just like, oh my god, this woman is brilliant. It's just, She's brilliant. I, I just yeah, love and it. I think for her to like. Because in the UK, she's so often played the heavy, like these like really intense dramatic parts. And she's really funny and really skillful. And again, I feel like, she, I mean, she's also given Julia real gravitas and, and um, which I feel very lucky. And um, so much of that, I think, comes from her, like being so protective of Julia and making sure that was there. But man, she, she can do the comedy and do the physical comedy and, and her impulses are great. Daniel, it's a pleasure to meet you. I wish you only the best. Hopefully this will not be the last uh, time that we see each other. But uh, I do appreciate your company and thank you for being in from Suarez Baseball. 
Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was really great. Really fun to talk to you and to meet with you. And this is all for this time. This is Julia Child. Bon appétit. <laughs>